Well, good morning, and welcome this morning. It is a wonderful day because the people of God are gathered together once again to worship the King, the Creator of the universe. We are in the book of Ephesians, and we are continuing our journey through the book of Ephesians. And last week, we focused on speaking the truth in part four of our Unity Through Maturity series. We speak truth not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it is who we represent, and more importantly, who we are becoming. We are being formed into the image of the truth because Jesus in is the truth. And the world in which we live is under the influence of the enemy. He is the father of lies. He's the antithesis of truth. He takes truth and he warps and corrupts truth. Therefore, that is one of the reasons why the world hates Christians. The world is more comfortable with lies than it is with the truth. Remember last week we talked about unbelief and the reason for it, one of the main reasons for unbelief. It's not because people don't have enough information and that it, that's not because the people don't have enough evidence. That is not the reason why unbelief is here. The reason why unbelief is here is because people have no love for the truth. Now, I want to go through these two verses because of one of these verses we went through last week, but the other one we didn't. Um, and I, I do want to go through these two verses because they're important. This verse here, and for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Why? The why is in verse 12, which is right after this verse, which says that they all might be damned who believed not the truth. Why? Why did they not believe the truth? It continues, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They have pleasure in unrighteousness. They love, light, they love darkness more than life. They have no love for the truth, and therefore God gives them over to their own lie. They want to believe a lie. This is why people follow false teachers. A lot of people follow false teachers, not because they're just being bamboozled by a false teacher, but they're, they follow a false teacher because they love unrighteousness because they have no love for the truth. Remember last week we went through this verse as well, which is one of the most profound verses, I think, in all of Scripture, when the Lord Jesus says, that Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. It is specifically because Jesus the Christ says the truth is the truth, and that is why people reject him, because they have no love for the truth. But for the Christian, truth is the currency of life. This is what we deal and trade in, because we have before us here in this book the oracles of the living God. Therefore, it's our duty and a part of our heritage as the children of God to know his word, to know it thoroughly, and to live in it just as well. So we don't only speak the truth in love, but we also live the truth in love. And we also looked at what it meant exactly when the scriptures say to speak the truth in love. That it's a popular thing that people like to say, oh, you should speak the truth, but in love. Well, what does that mean? With believers, it means to restore and to strengthen them, to exhort them, to admonish them, and if necessary, to rebuke them. The Bible is all over the place. It's all over the Bible in the New Testament. How that is our responsibility to hold each other accountable in the truth. With unbelievers, it should be to rescue their souls from the path that they are on. It is true that we are to deal with people in the spirit of meekness when we do this, but it is not primarily speaking about the attitude as much as the motive, because the motive is what affects the attitude. If your motive is wrong from get, then guess what? Your attitude is going to be affected by it. Sure, there's people who can smile and smile and still be a villain, but by and large, your attitude or your your attitude is affected by your motive. Why are you doing what you're doing? 
We should have love for God and others. That should be the motive. Which should come through in the spirit of how we give the truth to somebody. If you're giving the truth to somebody but don't have love for them, it's just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. You're like a tinkling symbol is just doing you absolutely no good. You must have love for people. You must care for people. You must care for the souls of individuals. We are dealing with the souls of individuals for eternity. There must be love there. If there is no love and you're just going about trying to win an argument, then you probably should just stop what you're doing. Because you're probably doing more damage than good. We must be motivated by love. We must be motivated by caring. And let us not forget that when we leave out or fail to speak the truth, when we are silent, that old saying, silence is deadly, is true. Because when we are silent, is many times when we are silent, when we sin against our brothers and sisters as well as sin against God, because we're silent. Because we don't say anything to them. Because we won't speak the truth. It isn't, not love to hold back the truth because you believe it's going to hurt their feelings. It's not love to hold back the truth because you're afraid of what people are going to think of you. It's not love because you're afraid of how somebody's going to react. That's not love. That's selfishness and unloving pride. In the first, it shows how we hate others, and the other shows how we hate God. Speak the truth and heal those, their souls first. Their feelings will get over it. So all of this is for the end that we may grow up in Christ who is the head. So this week we're going to continue on that vein. We're going to continue uh, because these verses are connected together. Um, we're going to conclude our series by looking at we're going to look at that more closely, how Christ is the head and what that means and how that works in the church of God. Now we're on Ephesians 4.16. Let me repeat that verse for you so we can get some context here. So we're talking about speaking the truth in love and then verse 16 it says, and to, um, well let me read just verse 15. It says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, in this verse, Paul gives a designation that is unique to the church of God in all of Scripture. He calls us a body. Israel was never called a body. The church, that is, that is a unique designation for the church. He says this very same thing in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, when he says, For as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So Christ is the head. The church is his body. And we are all interconnected. This is an exclusive moniker. Here, again, we have a picture of the unity of the church working in concert together. A body works together as a unit. It does, it does everything with purpose in concert with the rest of the body. A failure in part of the body being healthy and strong means that when that part of the body is called upon to complete its function, that it will not perform as it should. Another way that this can happen is when a part of the body attempts to do something on its own or in opposition to what the rest of the body needs it for. This happens in some physical ailments and diseases. Let me give you an example of this so you can get some context. Maybe it might be a little bit easier for you to understand this. One example is leukemia. I don't know if you know a lot about leukemia. and I don't even know how, why the Lord brought this example to me, but it was the perfect one. Let's take a look at that. With leukemia, this is not about something foreign that enters the body. That's, it's, this is not an external thing. Okay, This is totally the body. 
itself. So what happens with leukemia? The body itself produces an increased number of what's called immature leukocytes, white blood cells. Okay? Now, this is the body's normal function. The body's normal function is to produce leukocytes, but in leukemia, it just keeps producing them and keeps producing them and keeps producing them. It keeps producing so many of them that the body cannot produce red blood cells. This is why people die from leukemia because their red blood cell count is going down. So the body cannot function normally because there's something inside the body that is in rebellion. This is going to take us to our takeaway application point today, number one. And it's this. Church attendance is not an option. It is a command. Now I know what you're saying. How in the world did that come into place? Just hold on with me, okay? I know too many Christians that think that gathering with the church is some kind of option or they use some past bad experience in the church as their justification for disobeying God. Neither is something that God accepts. And like my mom used to say, God don't bless no mess. So the body of Christ gets its direction from the head who is Christ. Follow me. Okay, notice how the body should be working together as it gets its direction on what to do from the head, the head being Christ. This is why the command to gather is something that the head commands. The head commands that it, we gather because it is something that allows for the body to function in the way that he wants it to function. Let's go to our verse. This is Hebrews 10.25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. They were doing that back in Paul's day. If you want to say that Paul is the one that wrote Hebrews, and I'm one of those people that does. But exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. So look at, look at this. Number one, he says, you guys are, some of you guys are not assembling together, and you need to be. And then he says, especially, you need to even do it more as you see the day approaching. This should be something that you should be doing more of. It should be more of the gathering of the saints. More of the gathering of the people of God. In addition, you cannot divest yourself from the body of Christ and have union and fellowship with him. Did you get that? Let me say that one again. And you cannot divest yourself from the body of Christ and have union and fellowship with him. Why? Because he is the head. And guess what the head is connected to? The body. And what is the body? The church. And so if you have divested yourself and disconnected yourself from the church, you have disconnected yourself from the head. Because the church is what the head is connected to. Follow me. This was the Lord. The Lord was pointing this out in his preaching. And he also was pointing this out personally to Paul on the road to Damascus. We got two passages that I want to go through. The first passage I want to go through this morning. I want to open up your Bibles to Matthew 25. And we're going to be reading verses 31 to 40. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 40. I just need for you to hang in there with me this morning because, as always, we're always heavy on the scripture because we want to hear from God and what God has to say about this thing. So Matthew 25, verses 31 to 40. Now follow along with me. It says this, and this is our Lord speaking in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. 
And then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. And I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. And the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and, and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison or come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Follow along with me now. Now I want you to go to Acts chapter 9. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 5. Acts 9, 1 through 5. And follow along with me as we go through this. This is Paul's famous Damascus Road encounter. So in verse 1 it says, Then Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, that's what it was called, the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now I want you to notice something. He stops Paul in his tracks and says, why are you persecuting me? But we find out in verse 1, Paul was going around persecuting who? Disciples. And Jesus did not make any distinction. You persecuting my people, you are persecuting me. And in that Matthew passage, he says, hey, you did all these things to me. And they're going to be like, when did we do all those things? As you have done it to the least of these, my brethren. You've done it unto me. When a Christian attempts to separate themselves from the body, they are acting like the leukocytes in leukemia. You, you were kind of wondering when I was going to get back to that, right? Leukocytes in leukemia are rogue cells not doing what they are supposed to do. They are not taking their cues from the head, but are now doing what they think is right. They're just doing their own thing. And actually, they are doing the body more harm than good. When we reject and avoid fellowship and communion with the body of Christ, we actually are rejecting, here we go, we actually are rejecting Christ who is tied directly to the body because Christ is the head. He's the head. There is no getting around that. All these excuses that I hear from people who don't have a regular fellowship that they attend with. We're talking about local fellowship because that's where Christ is. I don't know if you knew that, but that is where he is. Whatever attitude that we have towards the church we have towards Christ. If you truly love Christ, you'll love the church and have the same affection for them, wanting to be around them because they are your people. You want to be in the church, in and around the church, gathering with the church, loving on the church, serving in the church. The excuses disobedient Christians give for not fellowshipping is never an excuse. It's only reasons for their dulled conscience on the matter. The body, it says here in, let's go back to Ephesians. 
Ephesians 4, it says, From whom the whole body joined and knit together, joined and knit together, KJV version says, to be fitly joined together. Let's look at that. Fitly joined together. Greek word now, say that word fast three times. <laughs> it is sunarmalageo. And I had to get the phonetic on that. Sunarmalageo. Yeah. Sunarmalageo. It means to render close, jointed together, to organize compactly. It's speaking of a closeness here. It's speaking of a, of a oneness. It's, it's derived from the, another Greek word, soon. Soon, which means union with or together. So again, we, we're seeing this common theme throughout Ephesians 4 of unity. There's that unity again, being fitly that perfect man, that body, that unity. And then to magnify this, he keeps going. And he adds that the body is compacted. He says, he says, the whole body joined and knit together. It's a Greek word, sumbibadzo, meaning to force or to drive together. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown in their commentary express it as a firm consolidation. I like that. A firm consolidation. To unite in association or affection. So you, you, you see as Paul is, is laying out this metaphor, what he's saying here is that we, we should be tight. We should be united. We should be close together as the body. So all in all, the body is to be organized compactly, driven together, united in association and affection. That's what Paul is saying. So how is this accomplished? It's by every member passing on their propping on their proper function, work, and blessing to other members in the body of Christ. Again, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, they say this. It says, the joints are the points of union where the supply passes to the different members, furnishing the body with the material of its growth. That's how stuff passes in your body. It's you know, through joints and ligaments and stuff. That's connected, right? Connected the loin, uh, ligaments and so forth are connected to the joints, right? If it weren't, then you have stuff just all over the place. Matthew Henry says it like this. He says, being orderly and firmly united among themselves, everyone in his proper place and station. Everyone in his proper place and station. Let's look at takeaway point number two. For application, commune with the body to unite with the body. The proper station that Matthew Henry is talking about, the proper station for every Christian is in the body, not outside of it. We should not let gathering with the church become some kind of ritual, but it is something that we should look forward to. I'll be quite honest. Sundays, I love Sundays. Love me some Sundays. Love Sunday. Not only because I get to teach and be in the Word of God on Sunday, but I get to be around the people of God and we get to talk about those things of God. Those things that we're kind of pressing out throughout the week and, and helping one another and ministering to one another. I love that. I look forward to that. I look forward to us going out and maybe doing some ministry or whatever and just ministering to one another. I look forward to that Sunday. I'm going to be honest. It's my, the first Sunday is my favorite day of the week. It is by far. You have people whose favorite day is Friday and Saturday because they want to go out and want to start drinking. And Sunday is not that good because they're trying to, you know, recover from the hangover that they had from Friday and Saturday. But Sunday, well, for me, it's my, it's my from favorite day of the week. It's a day where the saints we get together and we, we talk about God and we talk about truth and we help one another and we bless one another and we're free to do all these things over... That's, that's, this, this is bar none my favorite day. But there's no true unity with the body when you are trying to operate outside of the body on your own. How do you 
be united and fitly compacted with the body if you're over there. And the body's over here. Right. How do you do that? How do you function in the body outside of the body? You can't. You must commune and have unity with the body in order to be effective for the body. See, this is a lie of the devil. This is where he wants you. This is where Satan wants Christians. He wants Christians outside of the body. He doesn't want Christians joining together and loving on one another and encouraging one another, strengthening one another, restoring one another. He doesn't want that. He wants you outside of the body on your own. He wants you away from the blessing. He wants you away from the strength. He wants you away from the protection of the rest of the body. Like a lion, he's looking for that stray one that's been separated from the herd. He's looking for it. Easy pickings. He's looking for that one that's straying away from the herd. Those who have lulled themselves into a false sense of security because the herd might be nearby. But they really don't want to be in the herd. Well, I'm going to go over here and do my thing and then... The devil, like a roaring lion, is what? Be sober, be vigilant. So you should be paying attention here. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. He is looking at the menu. And he lines up on the menu. Those who are outside of the body trying to do it on their own. The devil loves those people. He pounds the mess out of them. He's like, yeah. He gives them all kinds of excuses and reason why they won't gather and have strengthening and fellowship and communion and encouragement and exhortation with the body. He gives them all kinds of excuses. Not this is foolish. This is the foolish Christian. And they're going to be taken by their own foolishness. That's what it says. The wise in heart, they're going to receive the commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. You're going to fall. I don't care what excuse that you want to give for not gathering with the church, you're calling yourself a Christian. I have some serious questions about your love for God. Serious questions. When we can't do simple things like gathering with the church and regular Bible study and regular prayer and stuff, stuff like that, when we don't do those simple things, but you want to say, I love God. And it might be true, but I, I, it's not showing. Your witness is being destroyed and that is dishonoring to God. That is not where we want to be, beloved. That's not where we want to be. The body is for our own good. To be with the body, commune with the body, fellowship with the body. This is for our own good. There's no perfect church out there. I never said that there was. But what I'm saying is that God has a command. Hebrews 10.25 is not an option. It's an imperative. It is command. Fail ye not to assemble yourselves together. That starts off with an imperative. It starts off telling you, fail not. But we got a whole bunch of leukocytes out there kind of doing their own thing. And when people of the world see that, then they say, oh, well, then, you know, that must be how, how they roll. They ain't really that close. It must not be that important. See, people look at that and they say, oh, well, you know, attending church ain't that important because they say that they're a Christian. They don't ever go to church. They ain't never in church. Doing more harm than good. Everyone within the church, as we have said before, has a ministry. And this ministry is worked out in two ways, right? It's, it's ministry and worked out in the church, to the church, I should say, and to the world. There you go. To the church, to the world. If you're not serving the church, you're not fulfilling the purpose that God has called you. And like the leukocytes, you're doing more harm than good if you're calling yourself a Christian. Our ministries are empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, 
with whatever measure of grace and power that he gives. Whatever he has bestowed upon us. Romans 12.6 says, Having then gifts differing, according to what? According to the grace that is given to us. With the prophecy, let us prophesy. What? According to the proportion of faith. You know what that means? Everybody's got a different portion here. Everybody doesn't have the same portion. Some people got more than others. Some people got less than others. It's all different kinds of portion. So according to whatever God has given you, you work your gift. And you work it to the benefit of others. And this all leads to what we expressed a few weeks ago about growth. Remember when we talked about growth? God expects growth. He expects growth from the Christian. When we are all working together as a body, together in unity, uniting compactly organized with unified affection for one another, the body grows. And it's not us individually, but the whole body grows. Everybody is benefiting. The whole body in its strength it's benefiting, in its health it's benefiting. And this is not seen primarily through numerical growth. That might be a byproduct of it. But more than that, this is seen through growth and grace and mercy and faith and the fruits of the Spirit. Solidarity with other members of the body of Christ or unity. All of this in love. This then leads to fulfilling the command that our Lord left with us, which was John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. This all leads to that end, love. Remember we talked about when we speak the truth in, in love. That's the motive here. The motive has got to be love. You've got, you got to care and love about people. I don't care. I, I, I was talk about myself because I didn't have it and I didn't have it for a long time I had the gift of being able to teach but I did not have the heart for God's people and he has changed me 180 degrees I love God's people I want to see the best for God's people and you know, God knew he had to do that in order for me to have a a pastor's heart, you can't be a pastor and not care for people. There are some out there that are like that. Mm -hmm. And you know it. You know it when you meet them. They don't really care for people. If you have a pastor's heart, then you care for people. And you want the best for them. And you want to press them and push them out and give them truth and do whatever you can to help them and equip them to go out and to be a blessing to the world and also not only a blessing to the world but a blessing to the church when they come in. This is this love for one another that we are supposed to have. This is how others will know that we belong to him and in so doing, we will glorify his name. Hmm. Takeaway application number three. Takeaway application number three, which is oh, well, it's supposed to be. I didn't put it in there. So write this down. Takeaway application number three. Gathering with the church fulfills Christ's command to love. Gathering with the church fulfills Christ's command to love. The ministry that God has given each of us should be for the benefit of others in the body of Christ. That's the we have gifts so we can bless other people. We have gifts so that we can serve. I'm here speaking to you today, not just as a speaker, but to serve, to help. To I want you to be strengthened. I want you to be, uh, your foundation to be built up. I want you to be all that you can be in Christ. That is my goal. That is my desire. That is my heart for people who hear me speak and teach. I serve as a teacher. That is my ministry. And though these same ministries are to be shared with the world as well, so we don't just share our ministries to the church, but we do it 
to the world as well. You, I teach the world as well about Christ when I talk about truth and I talk about Christ and I talk about the gospel. And not only then, but I serve the world even when I go to work and I work my job, my vocational pastor here. So I go and I work my job. And when I go out and do my job well, that is actually serving the world in the gift that God has given me. I have more than one gift. Mostly, most people do. And we should use all of those to serve and minister to others, wherever we're at. Yes, we have gifts, and yes, they should be shared with the world. But the body, the church, that's the priority. That's the priority. Galatians 6.10, which says, As we therefore have opportunity, right, let us do good unto all men, but especially, especially unto them, who are of the household of faith. The body of Christ has preference here. And if you're not in the body of Christ, if you're divesting yourself from gathering with the body of Christ, how in the world can you fulfill that edict right there? It's very hard to do that. See, there must be an affection for the church in our hearts that compels us to serve. We should want to serve. But first, there must be a love for God so that we obey with joy. Without love being the impetus that drives us, it ends up being a dry ritual, which doesn't do anybody any good. That's just when you just start going through the motions. It's not doing you any good. It's not... It's not glorifying God. It's not you're not being an example. And you're just going through the motions. You might as well just stop. Right. We should serve in the joy of love to God. And then we will be effective for God and to the church and to the world. Beloved, Facebook fam and everybody else that's here. Those of you who are listening who are Christians, love your people by serving them. Serve them in the context of your local congregation because that is what the Lord Jesus Christ has set up. You're going to be blessed. Your Savior is going to be pleased. And your God will be glorified. God bless you and keep you, beloved. Until next week. And join us tonight, 6 o'clock, same place. We're going to be going through our book, Can I Be Sure I'm Saved? So until that time, God bless you and keep you.